everybody. Well, let's open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to begin at verse 8, and as Pastor Nate just mentioned, we're going to go down to the end of the chapter. I've so enjoyed this time in the book of Hebrews, and I really think that God has spoken to us. I, I know he's spoken to me through this book, and so I really anticipate that, uh, that this morning will be no exception, that God has something to say to us through his word. So let's give attention to it now. Uh, I'm going to open up with prayer, and then we can begin. Father in heaven... We believe, Lord, that this is not just an academic exercise. It's not just an intellectual exercise. Uh, Lord, we're not just uh, poring over ancient texts as interested readers. But we believe that there's something in this word, this word of yours, that brings us into connection with the living God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do that. I pray that there would be a blessing Lord, even bold enough to ask for an outpouring of your spirit upon us now as we spend time in your word and that you'd teach our hearts, that you'd teach our life. In Jesus' name, amen. This uh, last section of the letter of the Hebrews comes to us as a series of exhortation. And remember the audience again. This is a community of Christians from a Jewish background. And they lived as a minority group in a larger majority group of Jewish believers, or excuse me, uh, Jewish people all around them. As we're going to see at the end of our text today, this Jewish community was probably in Rome. And you would just say, and I'm just going to throw out a number because it was probably much larger than this. Let's just say there's a community of 10,000 Jewish people in ancient Rome. Well, let's just say out of that community of 10,000 Jewish people, there's a subset, and again, I'm just throwing out a number. It's probably much more than this. But let's say 200 Christian Jewish people from that. Jewish people have come to trust in Jesus as their Messiah. Well, now, this is a series of exhortations to them at the end of the letter meant to encourage and instruct them. So let's begin now first with verse 8 where he says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today, and forever. It's a little bit difficult because my intention is to make it to the very end of the chapter today, and I could spend a half hour, 45 minutes speaking just on that one verse. By the way, I think you should be into memorizing verses from the Bible. What an easy verse to memorize, isn't it? You you probably got it down already, but it's an important principle. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging. This is one of the ways, just one of the ways, the Bible is filled with multiple evidences of what we call the deity of Jesus Christ. That he was not merely a man, but he's God. And I understand, friends, that is an astounding thing to say about a person. Because Jesus, when he walked this earth, it's not like there was something amazing in his appearance. There wasn't like this green celestial glow about him. When he spoke, it wasn't like the heavily reverb James Earl Jones kind of voice. I mean, you and I, if he was in our midst, you would think that he was just another person here attending the congregation. And we know that's such an amazing thing, maybe even an audacious thing, but the Bible tells us that this person who walked among us as a man, nevertheless, he was God, and you know, he had the credentials to back it up. It wasn't just something that he said about himself. And being God, he is, what the scriptures say, unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Friends, this is something that's very important for us to remember in our worship of God and our pursuit of God, that Jesus is unchanging. Therefore, we don't look to have some kind of faith or some kind of belief among us that is absolutely new. When I open up the Bible to try to teach you and help myself as well, I'm not trying to take the scriptures and look for something brand new that nobody's ever seen before. If somebody's bringing you something from the Bible that's brand new and nobody's seen before, run. Because, and this statement I'm going to say, I don't think it's absolutely true, but it's generally true. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. I'm not looking to bring you novelty and the latest and greatest and, and, you know, the belief of what's happening now and to be uber trendy and all of that. 
I'm looking to get us more deeply rooted in the truth that's always been there. That's my endeavor. And this is based on this fundamental principle that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, because of that, it should affect our worship and the way we walk with God. This is what he spells out in verses 9 through 14. So take a look at this extended section. He says, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good for the heart to be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them, We have an altar from which those who serve at the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city but we seek the one to come. Now notice first how he begins at verse nine, and it's a very logical transition. Verse eight says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse nine says, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. You get the idea? You you see, if Jesus is unchanging, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, We shouldn't be amazed or bedazzled by what's new and this new doctrine or that new doctrine. No, we should not be carried about with those things. Instead, as I said before, we should look to sink down deep roots in the truth that's already been revealed. This should be our attitude. What we look for is not to be amazed by a a constant uh, uh, conveyor belt of what's new, but instead, look at it there in verse 9. It is good that the heart be established by grace. That's what God wants to do. He wants to establish your heart, establish my heart, and do it by his grace. Not by legalism, not by laws, not by a great big list of things. You must obey this, you must obey that. Even though there are commands for us to observe in the Christian life, I don't make any apology for that. But the core of our Christian life is to understand that by grace, God has done something special for us. Therefore, he says, let the heart be established by grace, not through a list of rules. He sort of mentions that thinking in verse 9, not with foods which have profited those or not profited those who have been occupied with them. In other words, you can have a a heart that seeks to be established before God by a list of rules that you keep, or you can seek to have a heart established before God by the gracious work that Jesus Christ has done on your behalf. And I don't know, I, I don't know if you get tired of hearing it. Honestly, I don't get tired of saying it. The core of the Christian life is not what we do for God. The core of the Christian life is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. There there are obligations in the Christian life. I'm not trying to imply that there aren't. But that's not the core. The core is what God has done for us in Jesus at the cross. Now, in light of that, look at what he says in verse 10. And in my mind, the writer of the Hebrews has a touch of perhaps almost defiance when he says this in verse 10. He says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. I am anticipating that he's trying to encourage these Christians from a Jewish background in the face of some opposition and maybe even scorn that they would be held in in their present day. I imagine that somebody from the majority Jewish community around them would look at one of these Messiah-believing Jews, a Christian from a Jewish background, and say something like this, where's your altar? We have an altar at the temple in Jerusalem. Even though we live in the Christian community in Rome, we have this wonderful temple in Jerusalem and we have an altar, we have a high priest and almost saying derisively to a Christian from a Jewish background, where's your altar? And the writer of the Hebrews says, again, I picture it with just a touch of defiance in his voice. Look at those words in verse 10. We have an altar. Do not believe that Christianity is a faith, is a religion that has no altar. Oh, it's true. We don't offer animal sacrifices anymore. I hope nobody brought a goat with them this morning for animal sacrifice. We're not into that. It's very true. We don't do that. We don't have that kind of altar. But ladies and gentlemen, we have an altar where the ultimate sacrifice was offered, where the Son of God himself poured out his life to bring rescue to his people. We have an altar. It's the cross. It's the ultimate altar. 
And matter of fact, it's an altar that if you still trust in the power of animal sacrifice, you have no right to eat from it. Look at it there in verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. In other words, if your trust is in what some animal sacrifice can do or what your own sacrifice can do for God, no, your trust needs to be in what Jesus Christ has done for you at the cross. It's a very Christ-focused Christian expression. But for you to identify with Jesus in that way means that you're going to have to bear some rejection. You're going to have to bear some scorn. As Jesus did, look at it there in verse 12. It says, Jesus suffered outside the gate. Now in verse 13, therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. If our shepherd was rejected and if his sacrifice performed at the cross was considered illegitimate, then we also expect to experience some rejection, some scorn. And identifying with Jesus sometimes means bearing reproach for his sake. Friends, I don't know how you handle this in your life. I know that for me, it is a challenge. I sometimes have difficulty with this, sensing that everybody around me has a different opinion about Jesus than I do. And maybe someone who, and I hope this doesn't sound strange to you, maybe someone who loves Jesus, maybe someone who has surrendered his life to him, is, is mocked, is treated with scorn. Do you see what the writer of the Hebrews says to me in this situation? What the writer of the Hebrews says to you? That we should with great courage say, I will identify myself with Jesus and whatever scorn is placed upon him, place it upon me also. Let us, I love the phrasing there, let us therefore go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And why does this make sense? Why is this completely logical? Look at it there in verse 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. We understand that we live for more than just what we experience in this life. This life is not all there is. Now, I'll be very transparent with you. Even if this life was all there is, I think it would make sense to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I do. But when you add to the fact that eternity is real, and each one of us will stand before God on that day and have to give account for our life, when you bring that into the equation, there's no comparison, is there? There's nothing left to really discuss about this. We understand that we have no continuing city here on earth, but we seek the one to come. And we can do this, and we can do this with courage. We can follow Jesus, even bearing some of the scorn that is heaped upon him, if we keep that eternal mentality. So now he comes to verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. I love how he phrases it there in verse 15. First of all, he has appealed to us very um, uh, manfully, if I could use that expression, even with ladies present, but I think you get the idea. He appears to us, appeals to us with a great deal of courage and, and, and strength to live the Christian life this way, and he says, don't forget to praise God along the way. Did you see that in verse 15? Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Do you ever think about how strange it is what we do here on a Sunday when we gather? I mean, imagine somebody who knows nothing about church culture. Sometimes we get so immersed in church culture, we think it's normal. But you, you, you imagine somebody comes in, for church, they know nothing about church culture, and they walk in here, and they're kind of immediately impressed. Here's uh, several hundred people gathered together in a room, and they're all singing together, and that seems kind of weird. When's the last time you sang together with a bunch of people you don't know? At the ball game, you sang Take Me Out to the Ball Game or something like that. Well, here's the difference. If you sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game or even the Star Spangled Banner or something like that, you, you, there's usually not a sense that you should sing it like you mean it, like you feel it, like it matters. You're around a bunch of people that when they sing in the midst of what we call worship, 
They're, they're acting like it really matters, that it's significant, that it's important. And you might think, this is strange. It's not really my thing. Why do they do it? And that's a very good question. Why do they do it? And there's really only one answer to it. It's not because, oh, we love to all sing together as if we're going to get around around the piano after this and just kind of sing songs together. It's not that. No, what, what it really comes down to is simply this. We believe that it pleases God when we worship him in this way. And we're more interested in pleasing God than in pleasing ourselves, at least at this particular moment. That's what it comes down to. And so we're willing to do this, that in some context seems rather strange that we do it. But look at verse 15. It kind of gives us some real guidelines in how we should worship together. First of all, it says this. It says, therefore, by him. Praise that pleases God is offered by him. That is by Jesus Christ. It's done in him and with him in mind. I come to you, Father, on the basis of who Jesus is and what he has done for me, not on the basis of my own supposed goodness or approval from you. First of all, it's by him. But then secondly, praise that pleases God is offered continually. Again, I imagine somebody coming into our presence who doesn't know anything about church culture, and they come here and they, we're all singing together on a Sunday. They go, wow, that was kind of weird. And they come next Sunday, and we're doing it again. We're singing again. And then they come a third Sunday, and it's like, Is this what these people do every week? And the answer is, pretty much, yes. Why? Because we should be praising God this way continually. I hope a little bit of ire gets raised up within you when you think of how God is mocked and blasphemed and disregarded in this world. And I hope something raises up within you that says, there's going to be at least one place where he's praised. There's going to be at least one place where he is honored, where God is seen and glorified for who he really is. That should be us. That should be now. That should be Sundays. That should be whenever the people of God gather. That's why it's to be continual. But not only that, look at it here. It also says praise that pleases God is a sacrifice of praise. And friends, I think that's an important phrase there. It's a sacrifice of praise. Because for some of you, singing together with a group of people does not come easily to you at all. Matter of fact, you are just not inclined to it. You're willing to just, well, I'll let everybody else sing. I may enjoy it. I may not enjoy it. But that's their thing. It's not my thing. I'm here for maybe some other reasons. But listen, if praise is a sacrifice for you, then how much more precious is it to God as your gift to him? You know, for some of you, you'll sing any time. I see you on the freeway and I'm driving around. You're singing. It's like, like, wow, I wonder what's on the radio with them or what they're playing on their iPod. It's amazing. I mean, you just sing all the time. For, For you, it may not be much of a sacrifice to come together with other people and sing. You just love it. You're inclined to it. You enjoy it. And God bless you for that. There's nothing wrong and there's everything right with that. But let's recognize this. For those of us for whom it is difficult, for those of us we feel very self-conscious when we sing, it's just not our thing, do you realize how honoring to God it is when we say, God, totally, I am not doing this for me, I'm doing it for you. My preference would say, forget it, I'm not doing this. But I'm going to say, forget about my preferences, God. I want to honor and bring you glory. That is so precious to the heart of God. I mean, without trying to sound sentimental about it, I believe it makes God smile when his people want to bring to him a sacrifice of praise. And then finally, he says this in verse 15, that praise that pleases God is the fruit of our lips. In other words, it's words that we say. It's not enough for you. It's not enough for me to simply Think warm thoughts about God. He wants to hear the fruit of our lips. If I could put it, he wants you to sing. Now you know this is right. Isn't it glorious when we're amongst ourselves here and you can hear the sound of the congregation singing unto God? Isn't there something beautifully stirring in that? Doesn't it just kind of sweep up your heart for a moment? God, it's so right. Here are your people praising you. And it's so appropriate. It really fulfills the vision that we have for worship together. Friends, when we worship here together, this is what it is not. It's not according to this conception. You're the audience. They're the performers. And they're hoping that God helps the performers to please you, the audience. That's not the idea. 
Do you know what the idea is? It's like this. God is the audience. You are the performers. And these people up here are to help you deliver a good performance unto God. That's it. That's the conception of true praise and worship. It comes from the fruit of our lips. Now, what do you do? Well, sing. And some people feel very self-conscious. They, well, David, you've never heard me sing. If you heard me sing, you would not tell me to sing. Then sing softly, but just sing. <laughs> Let those with the good voices around you carry it, but sing. Say something. Give unto God the fruit of your lips. This is what the scriptures say we should do. Now, this is all important for our community of praise together here but this is what I want you to know that's not the only way you can bring a sacrifice of praise to God because look at verse 16 he says this but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased it's not only how we worship together it's how we treat one another and how we share with one another there would be something very wrong if if you um uh, worship together with somebody else in this room and then you went out and drove to a restaurant and then you started fighting and swearing with another person over a parking spot that you wanted to get. What does God say? Do good and to share. I mean, that's living a life of praise as well. So we don't separate the two. No, it's not only singing worship to God. This is a big part of it together that we do. But it's not the only thing we do together. No, we also do good and share with one another. This is another important aspect. Now verse 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. I find verse 17 very difficult to talk about. I, I find it easier to talk to you about money and materialism than I find to talk about verse 17. I find it easier to talk to you about sex and sexual morality than I find about and talk about in verse 17. Because there's no denying it, what it says in verse 17 seems to be a little bit self-serving. Can we read it again? Look at verse 17. Obey those who rule over you. And in the context, it's kind of like, isn't that strange? Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Friends, I feel awkward talking about this. And I also feel a little bit strange because to me, it's one thing for somebody else, like the writer of the Hebrews, to speak to a congregation and say, respect your leaders. Respect those that God has put in spiritual leadership over you. But to me, if a pastor has to stand up in front of people and say, respect me, isn't it gone a long time ago? I mean, it's just not there. But I don't think there's any denying that this speaks to part of the work that God wants to do in hearts and lives among his people. We are to be submissive to the leaders that God gives us, assuming that they have the character that's mentioned in the Bible. We're simply told to obey those who rule over us. And we obey them not because necessarily they're so wonderful. We obey them because they act upon the authority of God's word. I want you to know that's how I perceive it with myself. Honestly, I don't regard my opinions to be any greater than your opinions. We all have opinions about everything, don't we? You have your opinion, I have my opinion, they have another opinion, 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 opinion. It's all great. We could talk about it and have a good time talking about it. I don't think my opinion has anything more to merit it than any of yours, but I will say this. When I speak on the authority of God's word, I don't feel that I'm sharing my opinion. I feel bold as a lion. I feel that I have, in the proper and right sense, apostolic authority from God to bring his word to his people. And that's the sense I have in a very settled way. But to me, the idea is not submit to me. The idea is submit to God and to this book. And if I bring to you the truth of God as it is reflected in this book, 
then submit to God as the pastor brings forth the word of God to you. But please understand, there are some people who are misguided on this because some people take this idea of submission to leaders in the church much too far. I like what Chuck Smith had to say about this. He said this, quote, a teacher should teach us to submit to God, not to himself. That's what we're longing for, for us all to be submitted unto God. And this is the emphasis. And we do this because God is going to hold those leaders to account. Look at what it says there in verse 17. As those who must give account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Now verse 18. He's drawing to the very close of the letter now where he says, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably, but I especially urge you to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. I love how the writer of the Hebrews, this amazing, godly, and wise man, writing to us with the authority of God himself, he says, pray for us. Matter of fact, he's very urgent about it. If you notice there, he says, especially I urge you to do this. I urge you to pray for me. And friends, if I could draw a very personal, practical application to it for my life, it makes me as a pastor, as a leader, stand before you and say, please pray for me. I'm so grateful that many people do. And whatever good thing that God has done or is doing among us, I know it's because people pray. But I just encourage, would you pray more and more? If you think the ministry of this church is going well and, and you're blessed by it, then pray that God would do more. I mean, can anybody be satisfied? Doesn't everybody want to see more people come to faith in Jesus Christ? Doesn't everybody want to see more true disciples being made, sunk down with deep roots of discipleship in Jesus? Doesn't everybody want to see more of the nations reached, more of God's word going out and the world truly reached? Yes, we all want to see this. So what do we do? Well, one of the key things to do is to pray, pray, pray. And I don't feel selfish when I say pray, pray. For me. I need it. Well, for example, this next week on Thursday, I get on an airplane and I'm going to go to London, England. I'm going to speak at a one day conference on Saturday. I'm going to teach twice at this conference to pastors and leaders and whoever else can come. That's on Saturday. Then on Sunday, I'm going to preach at a church in Wales, Cardiff, Wales. And then in the evening, I'm going to preach at a church in Bristol, uh, England. And then throughout that, before, beyond, behind, I'm going to be spending a lot of personal time with pastors and leaders, hopefully imparting something to them, blessing them, encouraging them, doing whatever I can. Now, why would I do such a thing? What, 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 why would I leave such a wonderful place as Santa Barbara to do that? Well, because I really believe that God wants me to do this and encourage. It's not glamorous. But I believe God can do something good, but, but only if people pray. By the way, you know who's going to preach here next Sunday? Um, You guys know John Corson. His son, Ben Corson, is going to preach here next week. And probably most of you never heard Ben Corson before. He is amazing. I heard him at a conference some weeks ago, and I said, we got to have this young man come to our congregation. I am so excited about Ben Corson coming here and preaching next Sunday. It's going to be marvelous. But, But look, pray for me. It's going to be pretty much a grinded out trip. You'll go and come back. I'll be gone like seven days and have jet lag probably to deal with on both ends. Why would I do such a thing? Well, because I believe God will use it, but he'll only use it if people pray. So I thank you for your prayers. And reading this just reminds me of my great need for prayer. All right, coming up to the close of the book now, verse 20, he's going to pronounce a blessing over them. He says this. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a blessing given on the style of the great ironic blessing in Numbers chapter 6. And it's almost as if this, the writer of the Hebrews wanted these Christians to know, you are blessed. I pray for your blessing before God. Because friends, it's really a two-way street. I hope that you pray for me, but I want you to know I do pray for you. 
And I pray for God's blessing upon you. I, I pray for you by name. I pray for you by face. I pray for you by congregation. But friends, I pray for you for God's blessing upon you. And I trust we're a community that prays one for another. I think it's so beautiful here how he longed that the God of peace, that the great shepherd would pour himself out upon him. That the the same God that brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that that the great shepherd would give them love through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And verse 21, make them complete in every good work. We need this blessing from God. And then finally, to conclude the letter, verse 22. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation. For I have written to you in a few words. A few words, it's 13 chapters. You wonder what a lot of words would be to him. But you see, that was a short letter. He had so much more that he could have said. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. I think that's such a fitting conclusion to the end. This ending of grace. Where it's as if he stands over the people that he writes to. And as he pens those words to the parchment. He says, I pray that the grace of God be with you all. As is totally appropriate. I mean, any book here that emphasizes this transition from the old covenant based on law to the new covenant based on God's grace. Isn't that rich in the grace of God? This is what we need to live in. This is what we need to walk in. This manifold, rich grace of God. So it's fitting that he says, grace be with you all. Amen. Father, that's my prayer. I pray that your grace would be with us all. I I wonder, Lord, if there's not a heart here that either in fact or in feeling has not truly been touched by your grace. Well, Lord, would you change that? Would you bring a touch, a work of your grace to that heart? Would you pour out your spirit upon them? Would you help us all to walk in this new covenant, in the superiority of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and confident, Lord, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us to do this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.